What is it that makes the British seaside sinister? Why does it seem to attract so many killers? Is it the fact that the tide washes away their sins? Is it the fact that it's the end of the line? There's nothing overly frightening about a big wheel or a carousel. But what is undeniable is that the British seaside attracts and has always attracted death and murder. Hello, I'm Geoffrey Wansell. I write about crime, true crime. And in this new series, I want you to join me on a journey to the cliff's edge, where land meets the sea and where life meets death. For make no mistake, there is something sinister about our British seaside towns. On the surface, they're all fun fairs, candy floss and breezy promenades. But by digging a little deeper in the sand, we uncover an underworld of misfits and misfeasance, murder and mayhem. And reveal the dark lives of the most deadly coastal killers to ever stalk our shores. Trustthorpe on the Lincolnshire coastline. It's a quiet place for families to holiday and for retired folk to enjoy their twilight years in peace. This is the voice of a man who said he was holidaying there in 2004. All I've done is gone down the coast, I've travelled about the coast, because I was on holiday, which I do most weekends. But this man was not on a family holiday. He was there to order a double murder. His name was Colin Gunn. This story of a brutal murder of two completely innocent 50-year-olds does not begin at the seaside. It ends there. It's the classic tale of running away, of trying to hide and in fact, it leads to nothing but death. Death in the most extraordinary, ugly manner, with an assassination by two men dressed in boiler suits in a tiny bungalow on the Lincolnshire coast at Trustthorpe. There is something so deadly, so awful about this killing, because they had done nothing whatever to deserve it. This is perhaps the most shocking story of all in this series. The story of not only the murderer, but an innocent elderly couple, John and Joan Sterland, whose dreams of retirement by the sea turned into a nightmare unlike any other. The story begins in Nottingham, on August the 30th, 2003, when a young man called Michael O'Brien shot dead another young man called Marvin Bradshaw outside a pub called, believe it or not, The Sporting Chance. O'Brien shot one man and severely wounded another. The man he wounded but didn't kill was the nephew of a Nottingham gangster called Colin Gunn. We have been granted an interview 
with an undercover police officer who worked closely alongside Colin Gunn. He has asked that his identity be disguised in order to preserve his safety. Jamie couldn't cope with it. I went off the rails, uh, became uh, withdrawn, reclusive, uh, drank drugs and spiralled a bit into a oblivion really and that resulted in his death not long after I think it was within 11 months he and Colin were very close and Colin took that as a per took that personally it upset Colin but of course the repercussion and the, and the effects of that was such that Colin made his mind up then that because of what had happened to Jamie the O'Brien or his family were going to get the same they were going to get the same pain he was suffering what are you Gunn was a man who harboured grudges, particularly when he thought his own nephew, Jamie, was the target for the attack in the first place. In fact, tragically, Jamie Gunn didn't live much longer after the attack outside the sporting chance. Jamie descended into a hell of drink and drugs and died of pneumonia less than two years later. Michael O'Brien was soon picked up by police, something which undoubtedly saved his life. With Michael O'Brien behind bars, Gunn made the fateful decision to go after those closest to him. This meant targeting his mother Joan and her husband John. To understand why Gunn was so determined to kill John and Joan Sterland requires a deeper understanding of his thinking. Colin Gunn was a larger-than-life character who grew to be the ganglord of the Bestwood estate. He was someone who produced fear in the entire area, but also limited his excursions, his crimes, generally speaking, to that area. He was, if you like, within that estate, the lord, the king. He was someone who had nobody to oppose him, the police were really frightened to tread foot in there. He was someone who would get you or get your family if you didn't do what he said. And what he said was often to push drugs, to actually pay protection money. Someone who extracted a fairly lavish lifestyle from his local populace. Gunn controlled a gang of about 40 hard men. He and his elder brother, David, were feared. Gunn lived in the middle of a housing estate but drove a white Porsche with, of course, a personalised number plate which said power. He intimidated, he was six foot four, a bodybuilder, and he swaggered. He swaggered around the manner that he controlled. In his youth, Colin Gunn just happened to be there when a woman was mugged on the street and they chased, chased the mugger down uh, and stopped and apprehended the mugger. Unwittingly, uh, Colin Gunn will have come to associate all things criminal, the whole criminal world, the whole professional gang criminal world, with public approval, with excitement, with attention with good attention. For once, these, these playground bullies, which him, him and his brother clearly were, for once, the playground bullies were the good guys. Uh, and that will have been uh, addictive. I think that that has led, that, that set the scene for everything that has happened subsequently. Neil Woods was an undercover officer who infiltrated Gunn's gang and saw at close quarters how they operated. Colin Gunn is one of the most vicious gangsters that I've had any connection with as a police officer. He's essentially um, a thug who grew up in Nottingham, who became the head of what was called the Bestwood Cartel. And it's essentially a drug dealing gang who by brute force, as is the way with uh, 
with uh, drug prohibition, took over much of the supply of Nottingham and used quite extreme violence to make sure that he did it. They used violence to control the estate. They developed it and to such an extent that they had police officers on their payroll, they had uh, local people that they could influence and run their business. They were very hard-headed businessmen, criminals. At this time, Joan Sterland had seen her son Michael sent to prison for life for murder. In the weeks that followed, she received some strange phone calls and abuse in the street. She tried to keep a low profile, but these threats were just a precursor to the wave of violence that was to follow. Once Colin Gunn had declared it was to be an eye for an eye, the innocent Sterling's days were numbered, and they were about to find themselves in the aptly named Colin Gunn's gun sight. Joan Sterling and John Sterling were entirely innocent bystanders, and yet they paid with their lives because Colin Gunn decided that they should pay the price. Colin Gunn had ordered John and Joan Sterling to be terrorised at their home in Nottingham, causing them to run for their lives. They hoped that this stretch of the Lincolnshire coast in Trusthorpe would prove to be a safe haven, but it proved to be the place that they would die. For absolutely no reason, and certainly no fault of their own, John and Joan Sterling were now in the sights of one of Nottingham's most poisonous and dangerous gangsters, Colin Gunn. Colin Gunn was now fixed on revenge. O'Brien was safely tucked away in an obscure prison. The only people left that a gun could actually target um, was O'Brien's mother, who had remarried to Sterland, and it was almost irrelevant to Colin Gunn as to whether Mr. Sterland was related to O'Brien or not. He would do, because Colin Gunn wanted two targets to destroy in revenge for the two people Bradshaw and Jamie, who had been taken away. Gunn had arranged for somebody to shoot up the home of Michael O'Brien. And the parents, his, his mother and stepfather, only survived because they, they, they crawled on the floor to get away from the guns. Someone shooting through the Sterling's window would probably just a little bit too much of a warning because they were put into police protection and moved around several times in Yorkshire. They left their home in Nottingham in fear of their lives. They had a liaison officer in the Nottinghamshire Constabulary, but that did not in any way reassure them about what might happen. Imagine how you would have felt. Just think, you know you've done nothing wrong. You've done absolutely nothing to offend anyone. And yet, suddenly, you are the target for a notorious gangster a man who will stop at nothing, who's nailed people's hands to a table, who has tortured people. It's not surprising that the Sterlings were utterly, utterly terrified. They fled to North Yorkshire, they came back, they wanted to maintain some roots in Nottingham, but they couldn't, and they find themselves, in the end, fleeing to an obscure part of Lincolnshire.
They moved several times, they weren't happy, they didn't like being in police protection and basically came out of police protection and went to live in an isolated area on the East Coast, hoping that they wouldn't be detected by gun. Now, their location by the seaside was kept secret and should have been kept absolutely secret and we should have been able to trust the police mechanisms for keeping witnesses or the, or the families of witnesses safe. But from intelligence I saw uh, a couple of years later, it seemed quite clear to me that the information leading to that murder actually came from the spy, Charlie Fletcher. Did you get the message? Did you have a chance to... Uh, I've got, I, I will be today, so, uh, yeah. Did you say nothing had come of that as far as you knew? Yeah, no, we've been working on it, nothing's come of it. Got no evidence. Oh, no, any names come up? Yeah, we've got names, but it's worth more, isn't it? No matter where the Stirlands ran, nor where they tried to hide, Gunn always had an uncanny knack of finding them. The Stirlands might have been forgiven for thinking it was because Gunn had a sixth sense, but he didn't. What he did have was a young man called Charlie Fletcher as a mole inside the police. Charlie Fletcher was paid to join the police as a 19-year-old, as somebody with no previous convictions, no reason to make him suspicious to the police. And he was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. Despite Charlie Fletcher's efforts to locate the Stirlands, he failed. Gunn's entire network of criminal associates was now focused on finding Joan and John Sterland so that they could be murdered. He didn't know where they'd gone, but he knew how to find out where they'd gone, which was the crooks. And he called in a lot of favours, I'm sure of that. Um, but that was Colin putting pressure on and people being, even other criminals, of a reasonable stature within the city and the criminal fraternity being put under pressure by Colin to, to obtain the information that can lead him to the Stirlings. But we know for a fact that he utilised his, as I say, his criminal connections within Nottingham to gain intelligence around a phone number, put a, an address to the phone number. So Colin would have put into place what he needed to do to find out where the Stirlings had gone to. Having this network of loyal individuals around him, not only does that give him uh, the social credibility, the social support for these vengeful acts, but it also gives him a resource, an army, if you will, of people who are prepared to carry out the acts for him, allowing him to operate in, in a very authoritative, remote capacity, which then just gives him more and more credibility and gives his vengeful agenda, his revenge narrative, more and more credibility, as if uh, his acts of, uh, of violence are even more justified. The Stirlands had by now bunkered down in their seaside bungalow and were hoping for the best. But hope was not going to protect them against Gunn's obsession with them both being dead. They had, in every way, nothing to reproach themselves for. They had refused to go into witness protection because Joan Sterland, the mother of Michael O'Brien, had said, I don't want to say anything wrong about my son. And also, to be honest, why would you suddenly send yourself into witness protection when you knew you were absolutely innocent of any crime? You hadn't done anything, you hadn't incriminated anybody. In fact, you were just simply a bystander. It is unimaginable what the Sterlings must have felt when they were hiding away in a bungalow 
by the sea in Lincolnshire. My heart literally bleeds for them. John and Joan Sterland are now in the most impossible position. They are a target for one of Nottingham's most brutal criminals. Frightened, fragile, intimidated. Put yourself in their position. Imagine how you might have felt if for no reason at all, for no reason to do with you, that you would suddenly found yourself a target for a gangster. I can't imagine how they must have felt. I, I would have been terrified out of my wits, but they had to live with it. They knew what they had to deal with. It must have been inconceivable and their terror must have been overwhelming. John and Joan Sterland had made a home on the Lincolnshire coast, masquerading as a happily retired couple, when all the while they knew that they were hiding from Colin Gunn, a man obsessed with seeing them dead. In a terrible precursor to the events of that hot, sunny afternoon, Joan Sterland had taken the trouble to write to her contacts at the Nottingham Police Department. She said, and it is an extraordinary note, we have done nothing wrong. We are decent, innocent people. We have worked all our lives and now we have nothing. We are desperate to get out. So desperate that if we don't get out by Christmas, you'll be taking us out in a box. The tragedy is they didn't get anywhere near Christmas. They were gunned down in their bungalow long before. With Gunn having located the Sterlins to Strathsthorpe, he set about plotting their murders. In a cruel irony, he owned a caravan just a few miles down the coast from them, and it was from there that he ultimately orchestrated and ordered their murders. As defenceless as the Sterlins were, months on the run and in hiding had created a heightened sense of fear and awareness to anything or anyone out of the ordinary. On the day of their murder, they had sighted a prowler outside the house. On the day that the, the couple died, uh, a report was made to the police by Mrs. Sterland of a stalker in the garden. It wasn't responded to the way it should have been. There should have been automatically an alert sent out and vehicles and police should have attended. That didn't happen. I was uh, working in the communication centre. I was a duty inspector, um, you know, basically the, the, the force control room uh, where all the calls come through and where they dispatch people to various incidents. Um, I remember it was a, a Sunday. It was a fax that came through from an officer in Nottinghamshire Police. Just uh, the gist of it was to say that they would reported a prowler the evening before. I remember there was a handwritten note on the fax, something about, um, if I remember rightly, about a, a Lincolnshire officer that had been dealing with the Sterlings, some reference to shots being fired at their house in, in Nottingham, but it, it was one page, so of course it didn't go into any, any massive detail, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it didn't mention the, um, uh, the name gun on there. It might have done, but not that I can remember. My advice to the supervisor was, well, based on what we can see there, um, you know, it's difficult to make any kind of assessment. It's a Sunday afternoon, get in touch with the Lincolnshire detective that's mentioned, then come back to me if you need anything. Joan's call for help did not get the immediate response, which may have saved the couple's lives. This was through no fault of the local police, who had no idea that the Sterlins had been marked for death by Colin Gunn. Just a short time later, the horror which the Sterlins had feared for so long unfolded in their own home. 
gun made the phone call that ended their lives. He dispatched two henchmen, Michael McNee and John Russell, to do his dirty work. Colin Gunn gathered together the Bestwood cartel and focused their attention on the reprisals against the Stirlands. This, with Colin's deteriorating uh, mentality, meant that some of the henchmen that he gathered together were equally reckless and not particularly the brightest of the bunch. This was, if you like, almost a fatal flaw in Colin Gunn's level of planning and organisation. Colin Gunn sees it as his duty, as his right, to exact revenge. And that's what he does when he murders the Stirlands. That's what murdering the Stirlands is all about for Colin Gunn. Uh, it's an act of honour. They pulled up outside the Stirlands bungalow. Leaving the engine running and the indicators on, they pulled on their balaclavas. They then filed through the back garden, pistols in hand. Bursting through the door, they found John Stirland. He was making a cup of tea in the kitchen. He took seven shots to his body. The other gunman moved through the house until he found Joan Sterland. She was in the bedroom. She was shot at point-blank range. With the couple both dead on the floor, the gunman fled the house. John and Joan Sterland were nothing to do with the criminal world at all. They were completely naive to it. But to Colin Gunn, they were just somebody, they were just people who needed to be murdered for his reputation building and to, to metre out punishment. My shift would have finished probably at about 7pm. Um, as I now understand it, the uh, police went round to the house at about 9.30pm, I think, on the same day. Um, I would have come back on duty the next day at 7 a.m. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, you don't get a, a, a double murder every day of the week, certainly not somewhere like Lincolnshire, certainly not a shooting. I mean, my answer to why I didn't deploy armed officers at the time was that, based on the information I had, I didn't have enough to suggest a serious enough risk assessment. Um, so. It's a matter of, of gathering information, of course, there comes a time when you, when you have to come to an assessment, but based on what I had, there was insufficient. If I'd have known more, then who knows, my reactions may well have been different. Not surprisingly, the police in both Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire had to accept that they had something to do with the murders of the Stirlands. In fact, Nottinghamshire Police had started a covert operation, Operation Utah, to investigate Colin Gunn some time before. It was so secret an operation that most people in Nottinghamshire Police didn't even know that it existed. The officers involved in it, in fact, never went near a police station. It was one reason why Nottinghamshire did not inform Lincolnshire of what was happening to the Stirlands, and that, in its own way, contributed to the terrible death of the Stirlands. Nottinghamshire police were criticised, and um, you know there was a fair bit of criticism of, of that lack of sharing of information. I also know Lincolnshire police, you know, the, the force that I work for, um, were cleared of any any kind of fault on their behalf. It's not to say that, you know, there's not lessons to be learnt. extraordinary secrecy surrounding Operation Utah in Nottingham played a significant part in the deaths of John and Joan Sterland in Trustthorpe. The death of the Sterlands rapidly saw the police turn their attention to Gunn. His presence at his holiday hideout in his caravan on the Lincolnshire coast would soon form the focus of their investigation.
John and Joan Sterland had been murdered in their seaside bungalow in Trusthorpe in Lincolnshire. But the police investigation into unmasking their killer was proving to be full of twists and turns, with the main suspect, Colin Gunn, never quite within reach of the long arm of the law. In the wake of the tragic and unnecessary death of the Stirlands, a series of police investigations were launched. But no one suffered in the police force, only John and Joan Stirland. Finally, at the end of June in 2006, Colin Gunn, the instigator of their killing, was brought to justice. But he was not convicted of murder. He was convicted only of conspiracy to murder the Stirlands. Even more surprisingly, the two men he chose to assassinate them were both also only convicted of conspiracy to kill them. There was no conviction for murder at all. Colin Gunn's status was somebody who was protected by his henchmen. His next in command, if you like, formed a barrier between him and any evidence linking him to his crimes. Quite simply, the police could not reach him. There was no, if you like, forensic link between a crime committed and Colin Gunn himself. This would always be obfuscated by his henchmen. Colin Gunn had actually sent these people to carry out the murder, to commit the murder. He was on holiday in a caravan further down the coast with the perfect alibi. The police had the breakthrough they were looking for thanks to CCTV and mobile phone tracing technology. Colin Gunn kept a caravan near Skegness, about 12 miles south of the Stirlands bungalow. Cameras showed Gunn and the men who pulled the trigger, Michael McNee and John Russell, at the caravan park. But more important still, CCTV also showed Gunn on his mobile phone on the street in Mablethorpe, one and a half miles from the Stirlands' home. The police had the precise time of the call from the video and could match the phone Gunn was using to phone records, which proved Gunn had called the killers just moments before the Stirlands were shot. Right, somebody made the decision Colin's going to be arrested for this murder. I, together with a colleague, went onto the estate and we put the surveillance team on the outskirts. And we were fortunate we found Colin quite quickly, because sometimes it could be hard to find. He wasn't at his home address, but he was within the estate. And the surveillance team, we brought him to the outskirts of the, of the estate, the, the surveillance team picked him up. And the decision was made again, because uh, we didn't want to compromise the surveillance team, because we didn't know it was going to pan out that the decision was made that the arrest would be, or the stop, he was in a vehicle driving, would be by a marked traffic car, and it was actually by two marked traffic cars. And he was stopped in his vehicle on Hucknall Road on the outskirts of the city, uh, I think it was probably mid-morning, late morning, just before lunchtime. And Colin being Colin, I watched him get out of the car from a distance, and he was his usual confident self. Um, no doubt he was arrested for conspiracy to murder, because his face did change at that. Um, hold it for a very brief second. And of course, Colin being Colin, he would have been confident at that stage that he's, all right, I've been nicked, not been nicked for a while, I know what to do, I haven't got a problem. And of course, time showed that he had got a problem, thankfully. The criminal empire that he'd spent decades building was about to collapse all because he would not let an innocent couple live out their lives in peace. He'd been arrested today on suspicion of the murder of um, Joan and John Sterland. Can you tell us where you were on the 8th of August, which is a Sunday? This is the day that Mr and Mrs Sterling were killed. Well, it's an interesting thing about Gunn is he was very successful. As a, as a gangster and until he drew extraordinary attention to himself. So by the time he committed the Sterling murders, he was already a, a huge name, but that ensured that he would have enormous amounts of police resources. 
directed towards him. And there's no bigger resources than that, that would be used in, within the police as a double murder of people completely unconnected to the crime world. The bottom line is, Clem, we believe that all roads lead back to you and your family that are behind this, the killing of Mr. Mrs. Sterland. It was a, literally an assassination. Is there anything you want to say about the events of that weekend and the, and the days leading up to the killing? Gunn was subjected to hours of questioning by detectives, in which he gave very little away. In the end, his sole defence was that he was no killer, merely in the area enjoying the coastline in his caravan. I mean, I'm shocked that you've got me and accusing me of these things, on the nature of, of, of what you're suggesting is, is just phone calls. We put you at the scene of the crime at the right time, haven't we? You put my phones, if they are my phones, in the area. What, what we're saying, Colin, is that there's not only your phone in that area, but there's also like me's phone in that area. Well, the rest of phone in that area. If you had all a, the material at the time, if you, if you had a chap here, sat here, you'd probably get his friends' phones. We've told you what we think, and we've told you what the evidence is. Do you want to say that I had nothing whatsoever to do with it? I was up the coast with my family and friends. I met family and friends. I went to different parts of the coast, and that's all I've done. All I've done is gone down the coast, but travelled about the coast, because I was on, on, on a which I do most weekends, because I've got a van down there. And, you know, it's not unusual for me to do exactly what you're saying I did. My mum's got a place, like you say, right near there. And unfortunately, my mum's place happens to be right near to where it happened. But that don't, that, that don't mean that has anything to do with me. It's just that's where my mum's place is situated. Which is where a lot of the activity that you're suggesting I was doing was around. But that's because my mum's place is there. My nephew had just died. My mum's grieving. Having interviewed him myself many, many years before, Colin you couldn't get him rattled. Um, Calm would always listen to what was being said, but would never answer the questions anyway. But it, for Colin, it was about taking information in. What have they got? What can they prove? The questioning will give him that information. The evidence will be put before him. Colin being Colin would straight away be thinking, right, uh, right. I've got a bit of a problem there, can I get rid of that, can I get rid of that, can and of course in this case he couldn't. Gunn was held in custody and charged with conspiracy to murder, along with the two gunmen who'd killed the Sterlins. But the police were not done. They still had to root out the mole in their own ranks, who had put the Sterlins' lives at risk. A man who officers like Neil Woods had already had their suspicions about. The senior officer running the operation had brought two new police officers to back me up. I hadn't met these people before. The first one I was introduced to, this was about half past eight in the morning before the day's briefing. I shook his hand, I had no problem with him. The second one, I shook his hand and the hairs just went up on the back of my neck. It was like every instinct within me was screaming at me that this guy was wrong. And it was quite a difficult thing to talk about with the, with the, the guy running the operation. I said, boss, look, I'm just not happy with this guy. It's difficult to put my finger on why, but I just can't have him knowing what I'm doing. Now, the DCI was great, he said, fine, no problem, we'll exclude him and we'll exclude them both so they don't ask any questions and we'll just tell them to park up on the edge of the city and not tell them what we're doing. Charlie Fletcher found himself under closer scrutiny. His days of portraying his police colleagues was coming to an end and with it, a further piece of justice for the Sterlins. Although it was known that there was a crook police officer, that officer wasn't identified until a number of events happened, one of which was a search warrant being executed at Colin's mum's address. Found at Colin's mum's address were some police um, intelligence reports. Those intelligence reports and other bits identified Fletcher. It turned out that this detective 
that I'd taken great exception to, that I was suspicious of, called Charlie Fletcher, was actually an employee of Colin Gunn. And Colin had personally chosen him and asked him to join the police with the instruction to work his way into CID. So by the time I met him, he'd been in the police almost seven years. Charlie Fletcher was never actually convicted of passing that information on. He was not convicted as being part of the conspiracy to murder the Sterlings. He was convicted for the sort of the simple corruption, if, if that's the right way to put it. He was, uh, because he'd been in the police for seven years by the time it came to light who, who he was and who, who had got him to join the police. And he was sentenced uh, to jail just for that. In fact, in the summing up, the judge said to him, that he would sentence him to a year in prison for every year that he'd been in the police. Now, seven years, I suppose that's quite a lot for somebody who's in their early 20s. But in the context of the wider things that he did and, and the connection to the murder, that doesn't seem a very big sentence to me. If there's reason to apportion blame and look at things and, and learn from your mistakes, then you have to do that, don't you? That's what makes you a better police officer or a better investigator in the long longer term. You learn from your mistakes and you should also learn from others' mistakes and hopefully that will never happen again. Looking at the case as a whole, individual pieces on their own don't stack up, but the whole lot put together in the eyes of the jury were quite compelling. Motive. Strong, strong motive. That was played on heavily in the murder trial. Um, opportunity. The individuals that were stood in the dock with him. I think the phone evidence was crucial. And, and the, that evidence chain was crucial. The phone evidence around the number being obtained, how it was obtained, who it went to. And that's why those in, other individuals were stood in the dock with him, because they'd supplied that. And they needed to be in the dock for the prosecution to, to make those allegations and make them stick. For the murders of Joan and John Sterland, Colin Gunn was sentenced to 35 years for conspiracy to murder. Also sent down were the men who pulled the trigger, John Russell and Michael McNee. What I find slightly odd is why didn't they, with all their connections, take out Michael O'Brien when he's in prison? We know from the past that prisoners have been taken out on contract in prison. It would have seemed to have been a more sensible approach to have killed him rather than killing his parents. But if you want to do it, go for the parents and you really damage the boy as well. Typical of his ego and the type of person that he is that he's managed to stay in the newspapers from time to time since he's been in prison. I think it was something like 2011 when he tried to sue the prison because the prison officers were only calling him Colin or Gunn and he insisted that it was his right to be called Mr Gunn. The brutal, swaggering, six foot four inch gun was given a sentence of 35 years, which almost certainly means that he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. But Gunn is the most cowardly of all killers. He gets other people to do his dirty work for him. He kills at arm's length. Others do the wet work and kill. But this story must not be remembered for Gunn's brutality. It should be remembered for the Sterlins' bravery. It was their loss of life that brought down the curtain on Gunn's career as one of the most terrifying criminals this country has ever known. Join me, Geoffrey Wansell, next time for more Murders by the Sea. Thank you.